Hello and thanks for joining us. This is Astronomy Daily, the bite-sized astronomy podcast that uh, keeps you up to date with all the happenings in the astronomy and space science world. Well, we spoke too soon, didn't we? We had all our fingers and toes and arms and legs crossed for the launch of Artemis 1, but the launch has unfortunately been scrubbed. It's not been cancelled and put to bed forever, but it won't be happening uh, when they said it would uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, which we will explain shortly. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley. Joining me as always uh, during this uh, podcast is Haley, our uh, news super snoop. Hi, Haley. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for asking, Andrew. Well, um, yes, it is uh, very sad news about Artemis 1, but it, we shouldn't be too disappointed because it's not like the whole thing is going to be um, put to bed forever. Uh, there will be further opportunities to get the rocket off the ground, but maybe you can start your headlines by explaining what happened. Sure. The launch of Artemis 1 at the Kennedy Space Center has been scrubbed due to an issue with one of its pre-launch procedures. It happened during a key phase of the operation to ready the rocket for launch. One of the fuel tanks failed to reach optimum condition before launch. The liquid hydrogen in engine number 3 didn't hit its target temperatures, so the launch was scrubbed. The next launch window is on Friday. In July of 1969, mankind took its first steps on the moon. The journey there was full of danger and excitement, and the world watched with bated breath as two American astronauts made history. The original recordings of the event were made on reel-to-reel -reel tapes, which were later erased and reused by NASA. However, copies of the broadcast were made at the time, and a team of restoration experts has now managed to piece together a complete, high-quality copy of the event. The new copy looks even better than the original, and it's a fascinating glimpse into one of the most important moments in human history. The Enormous bowl-shaped meteor crater in Arizona that was formed around 50,000 years ago and was used as a training base to prepare Apollo astronauts for lunar duties in the 1960s continues to provide surprising results. In addition, it is a go-to spot for preparing Artemis crews how to explore the moon, as that place once did to train Apollo astronauts for lunar duties in the 1960s. Research payoffs from the out-of-this-world meteor crater are ongoing. Though we haven't found any aliens yet, a new study has found that there could indeed be life on faraway planets. Researchers from NASA have discovered that water vapor, a key ingredient for life, exists in the atmosphere of an exoplanet. The discovery was on WASP-39b, a gas giant that was originally discovered in 2011 with a mass about the same as Saturn, a diameter 1.3 times greater than Jupiter, and is orbiting a sun-like star 700 light-years away. The infrared sensitivity of the James Webb Telescope has confirmed the presence of carbon dioxide and while life on a gas giant is highly unlikely, the discovery does augur well for other exoplanets. Mm, indeed. And uh, yeah, who knows what we're going to find thanks to the James Webb Space Telescope. Thank you, Haley. Uh, to other news, and this one uh, involves China. I think China's been on uh, Astronomy Daily a couple of times recently. China has tested a space plane. It's a reusable spacecraft, not unlike the American Space Shuttle in design and shape. Now, the craft performed a suborbital flight before landing. Uh, China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation is working towards commercial flights, which they hope to start in 2030. You have to admit that China is really starting to uh, stand up as the biggest, should we say, threat or the biggest uh, competitor to uh, NASA in terms of the space race. Of course, uh, Russia's right up there too, but uh, several other countries are starting to show their prowess in terms of space exploration. Uh, Korea is one, uh, India is another, Israel, and Australia with a space agency now is looking at launches out of Darwin. So uh, who knows what the future holds, but uh, China is definitely going to become one of the major players, if they aren't already, in terms of space exploration. And, uh, well, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I know last time we talked about China, it was in controversial circumstances over that uh, that site in Argentina that they've developed. 
and one wonders what that is all about, but uh, hopefully good intentions are all they have. Uh, now, satellite company Terran Orbital Corporation has finished preparations for the launch of Luna, L-U-N-I-R. Now, this is a, a satellite uh, w- which was due to be carried on Artemis 1. Uh, it's designed to take infrared photos of the moon's surface as uh, Artemis 1 orbits uh, the moon whenever that will be, hopefully very, very soon. And another passenger on Artemis 1 will be provided by the European Space Agency, uh, radiation detectors, EADMUs, will be mounted on the Orion capsule. They're similar to some of the equipment worn by ESA astronauts, and they're about the size of a computer mouse. Well, they'll be on the hull, if you like. And what they will do will uh, measure radiation fluctuations during the flight. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley. And uh, last but not least, it's been a pretty quick podcast, uh, this one, uh, given the uh, the developments at Kennedy Space Centre. But uh, Rochester Institute of Technology researcher Dr Joel Kastner is the principal investigator on a one-year National Science Foundation grant Uh, totaling nearly $340,000 US that will allow his team to conduct a radio survey of the sky in an attempt to detect potentially life-supporting planets. He says, we want to understand how common these worlds are. Uh, And, you know, I think we're all pretty much excited by that prospect. He went on to say, we're trying to find out if Earth-like planets are very rare and if they're, or, or if they're extremely common. Kastner explains that only 1% of the available sky is covered by surveys that are sensitive enough to detect planets as small as Earth orbiting stars at distances similar to what is considered habitable. So the search is is broadening, let's put it that way. Okay, we're just about done. You got anything else before we go, Hayley? Yes. The 20 best books on astronomy and space science have been collated and it should come as no surprise. That some are written by the great Carl Sagan and Stephen Hawking. The list also includes Space Atlas from National Geographic, Constellations by Govert Schilling and Infinite Wonders by astronaut Scott Kelly. Amazing. Yeah, I'd love to get hold of some of those. Nothing of mine in there at all, Hayley? Um, well, I don't think science fiction counts, Andrew, but I'm sure they're very good in their own way. Yeah, I think that's probably a good place for us to finish. (laughs) Thanks, Hayley. We'll catch you next time. And that uh, is the end of this episode of Astronomy Daily. Don't forget to visit the Space Nuts website and click on the Astronomy Daily tab to catch your daily dose of uh, what's going on in astronomy and space science in addition to this. And while you're there, sign up for the free newsletter. And uh, don't forget to give us some reviews. We'd love to know what you think of Astronomy Daily. Until next time, uh, oh, and by the way, I... Should mention the next episode of Space Nuts is in the can. It will be out on Thursday. Uh, It's an all-question episode, Uh, so uh, tune in for that, episode 320. But for now, that's it for Astronomy Daily. I'm Andrew Dunkley. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley.